I'm Mike Comite. I'm Jacob Tender. Welcome back to Bantha Fodder. Hope you all had a great summer. I know I did. Question mark? Yeah. Yeah. D- did you? Yeah. No, I had a good summer. I I didn't really like. Uh, you know, I had my like one yearly vacation back in June. Um, but apart from that, like I've had a lot of interesting creative projects, uh, kind of coming in and out and working and major life changes. So yeah, it's been an interesting summer. But what about you? Yeah, same thing. I mean, just everything that you want to get away from while you're doing a podcast year round. Uh, then the summer, you know, you take your your break, and then you just end up doing other stuff that is equally like stressful and time consuming. So, <laughs> not much of a break. Hope all you uh, listeners had a good summer as well. We're back uh, for the new school year of Bantha Fodder. <laughs> <laughs> I I was assuming summer was going to be a really chill time for Star Wars with like not. Uh, much groundbreaking news and truthfully i don't think there wasn't we didn't get a new trailer for last Mm. jedi we got some behind the scenes stuff um which i definitely did not watch yeah behind the scenes stuff and like just a lot of um production news i guess yeah that's like production drama dramas that's that's the word you know like our last episode i think we talked about the last thing before the break was um what was it uh the, the we well we did talk a lot about the han solo thing and everything like that right did we even get into the the directors? We sleeping? definitely did because I remember listening to the episode when we posted it, and the news just broke as soon as we posted. I think about the the Lord and Miller getting canned thing. <laughs> Timely as ever. I know. Seriously, like we posted, <laughs> we're like, oh yeah, like I wonder what it's gonna be like, and who, and and it turns out that <laughs> everything that we hypothesize about is not gonna happen or whatever because because yeah. of these directors. We were like, we were super stoked for Lord and Miller, and then it just. You know, I think the right call was probably made there. Um, as far as episode ten, though, do you have any like quick thoughts on the decision to kind of exit Trevorrow from the project? Episode ten or nine? Nine. What what episode are we on? I know. I do the same thing. It's hard. <laughs> episode nine. Um, no. So yeah, as far as episode nine, um, I, I am happy about it. I was like, I was actually bummed when when he was actually signed to do the film and um i i you know just having watched jurassic world and i this i think jurassic mm. world is pretty divisive like you either loved it or you hated it i definitely dislike jurassic world yeah um and um i did like uh safety not guaranteed that was a really fun watch yeah so, like i can't say i hate everything colin Tre- trevoro is it trevoro 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 yeah I, I can't say i hate everything he's done i just didn't like jurassic world and that's like a huge franchise that he didn't like run into the ground he actually probably revived it you know but like i just didn't like no, yeah. what he did with it no i i think i'm with you there i love safety not guarantee an amazing movie but like i can't like really use that as a as like a reference for what he'd do with star wars i think looking at the uh jurassic parks movie that that's probably a more close comparison just because you know it is, it's a franchise it's something big yeah um, his last movie apparently did not do too well i don't know how much that played into the decision to exit him um but yeah i mean kind of kind of rough year for him now <laughs> yeah <laughs> losing yeah, star wars he's, having a bomb he's definitely movie. he's definitely not doing great um i mean this, this year i'm sure he'll rebound and he'll do something great but um this won't be it <laughs> yeah, yeah star wars won't be it i i i, did, I imagine he just crossed kathleen kennedy or, or just you know like he had other ideas and like ryan johnson's episode eight is is was like pretty much conceived on the back of episode seven like pretty hardcore mm-hmm. you know like with him having so much input on the end with like r2d2 being with ray as they approach Oct 2 versus having pb8 with her you know like that that was stuff that was like requested by ryan johnson so i i don't know i imagine that it's just a case of somebody of, of Trevorrow just wanting to do his own thing and being told like, no. Yeah. I, I do wonder like how much, how much the studio has in mind for the end of this trilogy. Like, do they have an idea of where the story is supposed to go already? And is that something that he just like, he had another idea for that. And they're like, no, this is, this is how it's going to be. We'll find somebody else who's like willing to go along with that. How much of that do you think is in play? Yeah, stylistically too. I, I I don't think he he would be he would have gone that far off the beaten path. You know, like mm. like I I feel like he he would have just gone and and made like another Jurassic World or something like that. You know, just like mm-hmm. I mean and I mean 
shot for shot wise like you know there's nothing wrong with jurassic world and action wise it, it happens it's just like boring script um but uh i don't know like it, it, maybe they just wanted the sure shot because you know like you, you we were we were talking about having like a pool for what directors we would want them to choose mm-hmm. to take episode nine. And you, you wanted JJ Abrams. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I just want the sure shot. So maybe I, I maybe I'm with the Disney team on that one. Like I just yeah. wanted to like, I, I like the way I felt after force awakens. I actually really liked it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and I, I would be open to having that feeling happening again. And I would imagine, I think you asked me about this uh, yesterday, the day before, like, what do you think, what do you think Ryan Johnson, what role is he going to have in episode nine? And I, I'm pretty, I, I think he'll just have like a like a co-producer, like some some kind of credit, you know. Like a, I hope he has a like a co-writing credit. Honestly, yeah. I feel like he has a really good idea. I, I mean, obviously, we haven't seen his movie yet, um, but just from what I've read and what I've seen of him so far, he seems like uh, he really gets where this story needs to go. And I hope that's the case. And if it is, then it would be great to see him work with JJ and Kasdan if Kasdan is still involved in any way. And um, and I imagine with JJ back in the picture that he probably would be, but uh, it just makes sense to like, yeah, like it, as cool as like the Harry Potter films are for having those bizarre like like director changes and like tonal changes that happen throughout those movies. Like, I don't think that Star Wars would, I, I don't think that Lucasfilm or Disney would is, is really like comfortable with that mm-hmm. change in tone. Like Harry Potter had eight films, you know, to deal with that stuff, and. Yeah. We have a trilogy and I'm ostensibly many more movies that are going to come after this. But I think Lucasfilm was just like, ah, I, like, we really don't want to like after the Lord Miller thing, you know, like fart jokes in a Han Solo movie or whatever, you know, like mm-hmm. Ace Ven- that, that was the line, wasn't it? Like Jim Carrey, it was like Ace Ventura in space was the new Han Solo <laughs> film, which I actually would love to see, you know, no. like, <laughs> <laughs> I would totally be down. But I mean, like, what were they what were they thinking? What were they expecting? They were like the Lego movie directors yeah. like cloudy with a chance of meatball directors get it. 21 jump street you know they just get that and they funnel it into it was a, a weird Star Wars pick film. to begin with and you know i like i still hope that it that, was a weird pick but it's a bold pick and i like that i know it was bold but I, I don't think it was right i think like to some degree like you should have differences in tone you should have you know uh some sort of diversity in your directing staff but i don't think that a han solo movie needs to be like a you know, a buddy comedy. This kind of goes back to that whole discussion we had, I think around rogue one and like what it means to have these anthology films and Mm -hmm. like, uh, what do we have when, you know, are we going to have a star Wars comedy film? Are we going to have like a buddy comedy? And that's what I wanted Han Solo to be. Like, I, I do want to see star Wars branch out into other genres and, that this was the chance, and and Lucasfilm's like, nah, we don't want what Mike wants. We heard that <laughs> podcast that we heard Bantha Fodder, and we heard that dude crowing about uh, buddy comedy Star Wars, and we decided the fart joke should not be in the Han Solo film. Well, I I still I still think we're going to see tonal shifts in Star Wars movies. I just think as far as this trilogy goes, they need to keep the tone somewhat consistent, and I think that between JJ and Johnson, I think that they probably have like a they have they have something good here i think they have a like the force awakens was great it was a really fun movie it hit like it hit all the beats that it really should have it added new things that were fun um we'll get into some of the things that people i guess didn't think were as fun in the in the meat of this episode but i think keeping the same sort of tone throughout this series is okay i don't think that we necessarily need to read into that for like the anthology movies. Cause I still think we're going to see some different stuff there. I think that, you know, putting Ron Howard in the position for Han Solo is a safe choice because God, they had to do something to save that movie. They, <laughs> they've been working on it for a really long time. How are they going to turn this one around though? Like, honestly, well, I, I don't, I don't think that there's going to be any issue. Honestly, like Ron Howard is, he's a, he's a master. And I think like if they would have got him, if they would have got Spielberg, I think bringing in somebody like that, who has the know-how who um who has like the ear of george lucas who knows the original characters like people that like grew up knowing the people that made those films those legacy directors i don't think we're gonna have a problem with han solo i think it's gonna turn out to be a pretty decent movie um but for the the next one you know whatever that happens to be boba fett or or uh or whatever that is um i don't know i i think we could still see something darker something lighter um, I mean, Apollo 13 and 21 Jump Street are 
pretty pretty far apart and that's what they're they're going to be trying to draw the han solo film i think that there's probably like meat left over from the lord miller stuff like there's there's probably scenes that can be used um i think that they just that's not what a, i feel like that's not what a director wants when they jump into the chair no, it's like, and, all right we got a lot of stuff we can use from this no thing. don't and, worry it's not and i don't be. think that's what's happening i they, they did a you know they basically probably started this movie from scratch but Ugh. like on a on a shorter time scale so who knows what we'll get what we'll get but like it's not like you know you know what that's, the, the, the people the, don't know their characters like the, uh, the the actors at this point should know their characters pretty well. And I think they know exactly um, what they could drop from their characters after Lord and Miller left, because it's mm. probably the stuff that they felt kind of weird about having in there anyway. So I imagine any reshoots probably did not take quite as long as as people would expect. And I want to see the Lord Miller cut of this movie. I, want, I just <laughs> I want this to be like in a vault and then just be released somehow like leaked. The Lord Miller version. I just want to see Ace Ventura in space. That's really all I want to see. Uh, the the more important question, though, is what's going to happen to Atlanta now? Because this is, is Atlanta going to get delayed because of any reshoots or whatever? Or no, they're working on season two. All right, all right. As yeah. long as I, I mean, I've I've been looking forward to it. So yeah, me too. It's a good show. And um, uh, Lakeith Stanfield is that his name? The, yes. Yes. Yeah, he has been crushing it this year. Can we talk about him for just a moment? I know it's a Star Wars podcast, and I, I hope he, they bring him into the the fold at some point because he's having a good year. He's a talented actor. I I watched a uh, War Machine, that Netflix movie with Brad Pitt. He had like a small like uh, part in that movie, and mm-hmm. it, it was very good. I thought. Yeah, yeah. I I hated the Death Note movie, but he was one of the only redeemable parts of that film, and. uh and he was also really good in Get Out, so I'm excited to see what they do with him. But yeah, yeah. all right, that was a good, good Lakeef moment. <laughs> all right, um, so yeah, uh, speaking of um, of the the current trilogy, uh, we're doing something a little bit different tonight, I guess. Yeah, I, I mean. We talked about fan edits uh, many, many episodes back. Uh, Very just, early on. Yeah, like so, like the Harmy stuff, uh, just like the despecialized editions and, and the Phantom edit and whatnot. This time around, though, we're actually talking about two movies that have come out in the last two years. Uh, I mean, the only two movies that have come out in the last two years. <laughs> Those being Rogue One and The Force Awakens, which have yeah. recently... I mean, I guess these these fan edits have been cropping up probably since these things came to like blu-ray and whatever yeah there there have definitely been others but these two came out very recently and i had access to them and they seemed like they were going to be hitting on some um some interesting themes whereas some of the other ones are just sort of like they don't really have a direction they're just kind of going at it when you messaged this to me um like you just you made me aware of these things i felt like you were showing me like a, a like a pivotal moment in like the the uh, i guess the appreciation of of the new star wars films which is to say mm-hmm. that there is like there's always going to be haters and like people who give movies bad reviews or whatever or say like oh it was like it was just a repeat of 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 uh whatever a new hope or whatever you know it's like that i i'm aware of but now there are people that are like discontent to the levels of like prequel trilogy you know like <laughs> People that are like, oh, we need to cut down episode one into a twenty-five minute lightsaber battle, and <laughs> that's and include it into the second movie. That that like, it's not that bad yet, but like, there is this discontent to the degree where people feel like they need to change the movie, and I, I don't know, like uh, this. I feel like this was what really illustrated it for me, and that's why I kind of wanted to talk about it tonight. Yeah, so I um I obtained copies of two recent fan edits. Uh, these are Heir of the Force and Rise of the Rebellion. Is that right? Yeah, and so those are two titles that people have probably never heard before, right? <laughs> yeah. So they're I, these are um, these are fan edits, and they're actually done by the same person. They were put out within the past two months. Uh, the The author of these is Dig Modification um, or Dig Modification. I'm not entirely sure the pronunciation of his online handle with this capitalization this is dig mod if dig modi fika shown if you want to go with those those capital (laughs) letters there that's some like aol instant messenger capitalization right there put a couple x's on the end of that and there you go you got yourself a screen name hell yeah (laughs) so i'll have links in the show notes to these so at the very least you can um 
maybe uh, you can you can kind of take a look for yourself at what these edits entail. As far as finding the actual video for these edits go, I can't give you any instructions on how to find them. It's not technically well, it's sort of a gray area, but uh, it's not technically illegal to have these if you actually own the original film. Um, so in my case, I do. Uh, Mike, I'm not going to ask you that question. My um, household owns these movies. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So uh, these were obtained through methods, and it'll be up to you to find those methods using the tools at your disposal. And um, and that's all I'll say on that. Um, I think the main one that we're going to be talking about tonight is Era of the Force. This is a Force Awakens edit. Well, there's a, there's a lot of good stuff in the Rogue One one that we'll definitely get to it at a later episode, but this one is just the one that Jake and I happened to finish before yeah, we I, decided I to literally, I literally, the credits started rolling as the Skype call was initiated from Look, episode, like, so. I tried to do the Rogue One too, but Jake, <laughs> there was like three gigabytes of this file missing. <laughs> so, I, so, like, it's just every five seconds. I, I could have watched Rogue One edit like with a freeze every every 10 seconds but i chose not to frustrate um the people i was watching it with <laughs> and we switched to force awakens yeah that was my bad in the middle of the the downloading process um i realized that i was downloading it to the wrong uh folder so i changed the folder mid download which split the file into two and then i tried meshing the two together and it worked and it played um at first glance, but uh, it was actually missing three gigabytes worth of data, which is a pretty substantial. That's amount. a big chunk of a movie. Yeah, I mean, this is like a fourteen gigabyte movie. So, um, my apologies, Mike, but uh, at least we got we got the one done. Yeah, we'll get two episodes out of this. Yeah. So let's. Uh, should I? I should probably start with the goals of this edit. You know, I think every 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 editor comes into a fan edit with. Um, a different goal in mind or uh, a a general theme that they want to hit or some sort of thread that they want to remove. Um, So I think it's probably important to kind of explain what they were trying to do with this movie. That way, when we talk about what we noticed and the things that we liked and we didn't like, we can kind of refer to that and sort of make those comparisons and see whether or not they, uh, you know, sort of like, hit those goals you know if they if they were able to achieve what it is they set out to do is that fair yeah i think so i i feel like the 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 goals of this one are particularly well stated too like there was a lot of intention behind behind this edit definitely so i've highlighted just a couple of portions um from the original post that was made on original trilogy.com uh this is a community that is uh very popular for those who make fan edits um, you can probably find information about this edit in a couple of different places. There is a website uh, called, I think it's fanedits.org that has some more information on this as well as the cover. Um, I'll try to find a link for that in the show notes as well. Uh, but as far as the original post goes, um, he sort of explains what it is that he wanted to do. And the main change that he wanted to make with this edit is to prolong the reveal of Kylo Ren's parentage. So obviously, uh, one of the biggest moments of this movie, um, something that actually kind of happened early on in the film, uh, with his edit that changes a little bit and we'll dig into that. Um, in addition to that, he, uh, also wanted to reinstate some original trilogy sound sound effects to the Falcon chase scenes. Um, so he, he added some vintage sound effects for that. Uh, he did some vintage, composited effects for the holograms so uh when snoke is is shown essentially instead of the new hologram look that they've been using um or uh, that they did they they did use in the force awakens they use the old school kind of flickering blue effect um he also added music to increase emotion in certain scenes uh and removed some minor dialogue and shots that he just didn't feel um was very star wars like (laughs) so uh those were like the main goals there were some other things that were um that are changed for example he was like when when he's kind of messing with the reveal of kylo ren's parentage uh he edited some lines or um cut back lines to sort of misdirect the first time right for first time viewers so that i guess they what's the goal here is that the viewer might think that ren is luke's son which I, you know what, I didn't read these notes at all, even though you definitely sent them to me. Um, I definitely <laughs> didn't read them before watching the edit, and 
I, you know, like uh, I'm just remarking to Aaron the whole time. I'm like, oh yeah, well this is, uh, oh, it's, well it definitely sounds like they're trying to make it Luke as yeah. the dad, you know? And lo and behold, I look at these notes and this, that's exactly what his intention was. So he, I would say it definitely came across. Cool. So yeah, that was, that was like another thing he did. Uh, he omitted a lot of like, a, there were a lot of edits to the dialogue between um, like Han and Leia and conversations between Kylo Ren and Snoke uh, that were sort of, they were truncated. There were just like lines that were sort of cut out um, to prolong that reveal that he is in fact the son of Han and Leia. Um, the next biggest e- edit from this movie was essentially just lobbing off the end of the film. So they pretty much just completely removed the section with Luke on the island. Um, his justification for that was that he knew that Ryan Johnson was going to begin the next movie with those clips. So he wasn't so worried about like a gap in the trilogy narrative. Uh, but that was, that's another kind of huge edit. He kind of downplayed the importance of Luke in this movie. So, um, those are sort of like the, that's what he set out to do. Um, he cut 10, about 10 minutes from the film in total. Um, I don't think that there are any like full scenes that were completely cut out. Nothing like major. Uh, it was just a lot of little edits here and there. And uh, I guess we can just sort of dig into what we noticed and, and see if we uh, or how many of those we were actually able to pick out. Yeah, there was definitely some I missed judging by our kind of like checklist at the end that we're given. Mm-hmm. Oof. Wow. It's like there's just so much here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like just it's kind of a huge endeavor just to to think about it you know just editing editing a feature film from your home studio like that's it's kind of a big undertaking that's a lot of like work i don't know it it actually highlighted a lot of the things that i didn't like about force awakens it's like it it took off the rose colored glasses for me you know like i definitely left the theater with a great feeling and subsequent viewings i was like this is great and then rehashing it it's like wow there's a lot of stuff about this movie that i wish didn't happen and uh, that i wish was like this edit um i mean let's start with the first thing we kind of see in the movie the crawl do you, he cut some stuff out of that crawl well yeah he completely changes it up like it's a, it's an entirely new crawl so when he uh when he starts this out it's the same starry background uh, as the original that way the edit into the first shot um is still smooth uh, I think he did a really good job on that. And I think throughout the entire movie, he did a very good job with transitions. I, there wasn't a single transition that I thought was like really, um, that really stood out as like amateurish. I think he did a really good job overall, but with the, with the scroll, he did put in like the new title. Um, so air of the Jedi is the, the title name rather than the force awakens. And then, uh, he fundamentally changes <laughs> what the text actually shows. Yeah. I mean, just the title change in general, air of the Jedi, that's, that's to bring in, I guess the heir is the, is the key term there, right? Just the who is the inheritor of this, and there's a whole bunch. It adds a lot of mystery to it. Cause the similar mystery to what we got when watching the movie for the first time, like is it Finn? Is it Ray? The, the Force Awakening, and uh, but with the heir term, you have you have like oh, is, who's the heir? Is it is it? I mean, I mean, heir is kind of gendered, you know. I guess if it was it was Ray, heiress, maybe I don't I don't know. You know, that's looking too far into it, but. But I just feel like, you know, we, we we get this idea that like somebody some character in this movie is an inheritor of of the of the way of the Jedi. And that kind of, you know, throws those red herrings around. You get like two red herrings now, which is Kylo Ren and, and Finn, in addition to Ray being the actual heir that we know of so far. First off the bat though, like he, he completely downplays the fact that Luke is missing. Right. I mean, that was that's the first line of the of the Luke Skywalker is missing. Right. Yeah. That's the first line. And in this one that line is in there. It's just in the last paragraph of the crawl. Right. So Yeah, I mean it, it still sets up a lot of the same information. Um it's a it's a decent crawl. I think he actually did a pretty good job writing it. It didn't s- seem too out of place. Um, it looked good too. You know, it wasn't like corny. Yeah. No, it, it felt it felt natural. So I think you know, kudos on that. Definitely uh well done with that. And it like I said before, it fades um, pretty seamlessly into the first shot with the you know that big ship crossing the planet face, and then those smaller ships um, flying out of it. So from there, it uh, it sort of jumps into the movie, and really, I didn't notice anything majorly different until uh, until the first order arrives at Laura Santeca's camp. Right, and this is this is kind of where you get the start to get the feel that there is some like 
I don't want to say amateur because I don't want to. I don't want to make it seem like this person is bad at what they do. Mm-hmm. That uh, did modification uh, is is not because this is remarkable, you know. But you, it is clearly a fan edit. It is not like you know they have very limited source material here to work with, and this is where you start to kind of see the oddness that can happen with like cutting lines too soon or like excising entire lines completely like moments hanging for just a bit too long or like it's also this weird cognitive dissonance you have to find yourself in when watching this too because you know the truth you know you know what is supposed to be said in these moments but you have to kind of erase your brain for a second and and just go along for the ride and say and like try and digest the dialogue as it's being given to you and i think the dialogue between lor santeca um is 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 different with with kylo ren there's like some stuff being left out of there yeah i was i was trying to remember what it was that got cut out it seemed shorter but not by much so i couldn't like figure out exactly what lines uh there were there originally so i didn't actually write any notes for that because i wasn't positive that anything had actually changed but it did seem not quite as long and and did they have that shot with uh with bb8 like running back like kind of like looking out over the the horizon and then running to the little hut did they have that i'm pretty sure they did okay um but i but again this is just like i haven't seen the original version in about a year Mm. And, you know, this is all, again, like, uh, just false positives here. And, like, just seeing, like, oh, maybe they didn't cut that dialogue short, but I'm just feeling it, you know, like, it's a, like, almost like placebo effect, almost like it just, I feel like there should be something being changed here, but it's, it's, or like, there, there must, something must have been changed here, but it's actually the original. I had to, I had to confirm with my roommate, who actually coincidentally watched the original version the same night that I was watching the edit. Just like, oh, wow, <laughs> this is... So was this dialogue in yours? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, it's good. Oh, good. I thought I was going crazy. I thought they he edited that one. But um, yeah, I mean, right off the bat, though, you, you start to see the things that, that um, the editor felt was not Star Wars-like, which is humor, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that, that's the thing. Like, he didn't explicitly say in his intro that he was going to be cutting out humor. He did say that he would be cutting out things that he didn't feel were Star Wars-like. And since, you know, lines like... So who talks first? You talk first? I talk first. That, that's not any... That doesn't bear on any of, like, the, the, like the Kylo Ren reveal or anything regarding Luke's whereabouts. So... I feel like that is just a stylistic choice um, of the editor. And I feel like maybe he just wasn't a fan of the humor. Personally, I like that line. That one was actually fine with me. I think everything, almost everything he cut out was, was better in the movie. You know, like I, I think mm. he sh- I think all that humor needs to be there. I mean, think about this. Like if someone was doing a fan edit of, of a new hope, like when Han blasts, see they're in the stormtrooper armor and that, in that prison block and, um, it's like it's like um everything's perfectly all right now we're fine we're all fine here now thank you how are you yeah <laughs> that that whole thing like would he have cut that too and that's like that's fundamentally star wars i feel like if, if you're gonna <laughs> it's like that's so han solo that's that's just that's that's cheese you know and that's yeah what, when i told you like oh they cut they cut a lot of the, the jokes you were like oh they're cutting the cheese i get it <laughs> and um and like, there's plenty of cheese in the original trilogy, so I don't yeah. know what's not Star Wars like about Poe Dameron. Well, that that's the thing. That's the unfortunate thing with cutting out all of the humor. Not all of it. They did leave some, but they cut out a lot of it, and a, and a lot of it was Poe Dameron. And a lot of Poe Dameron in this movie is, you know, it's like they're jokes. It's humor. Yeah, his character took a huge blow from this oh my, edit. Like, yeah, I mean. He, they didn't, they didn't have nearly enough Oscar Isaac in the movie to begin with, but this movie really cut out a lot of him. Yeah, and like everything, I guess any perceived characterization is coming from previous viewings of this mo- of the original version. You know, mm-hmm. like that's like if I was just to watch this edit now, it would have been like, why is this character in the film at all? You know, like, and I I think if anybody suffered more from the humor edits than Poe, it was probably Finn, just because he's in the movie more, and you know he has more of a. Not necessarily like uh, like funny moments, but sort of like um, like uh, I don't know what what word would you use here? It's they're not like necessarily awkward, but uh, moments of like hesitation or you know like uh, strange social interactions, like Finn's insecurities. Yes, his insecurities. Exactly. They wiped a lot of that out, which I actually enjoyed. I actually it changed his character a little bit it for me. It made him a little. Him. 
it does humanize him, but it also like I think when they cut it out, it made him more of a proactive character in this movie. He definitely seemed uh he he seemed more confident in his decisions, and even if they weren't like the greatest decisions, like you know leaving from Maz's place, you know it was he was more proactive about those things, and you didn't sense those um those insecurities and that fear nearly quite as much. And maybe that changes his character for the worse, but I think it sets him up better for the next movie where I think he'll have a greater role. I guess. I mean, it's hard to say what, like if this, this edit's going to service what comes next at all. Cause we have no idea what's coming next really. But, but yeah, I mean like you're right. You're dead on about the, uh, the insecurities part. Cause I mean, think of the next line. You need a pilot. I need a pilot without that line in the movie. You know, it just, this becomes a very like, meaningful like he's doing well he's trying to help a rebel pilot escape or a resistance pilot escape and he just like let's get out of here but like without that whole like you need a pilot it just like it it makes like when when that line is in finn just seems so much less like in control of his situation it seems like a, a way more plotted plan without the line well i th- i think they they only truncated that so when he saved him and he asked him why he was doing it they left it all like they cut the scene at because it's the right thing to do and i i think that's like again for me i actually enjoyed that i liked his character a lot better in this i think in repeated viewings that i need a pilot line loses sort of you know a little bit of its flavor i thought it was funny the first couple times i saw it in the theaters the more that i see it though like it just comes off a little bit as cheesy. So I think, but we just talked about how cheese is like integral to star Wars in I, most respects. I, I agree, but like that it, it's not, it's not quite as funny. It's not quite as like, like when Han says, you know, how are you? Like, that's preposterous. It's silly. Like it's, it's just like, it's, it's something like in the moment, like he has no idea what else to say. So he says that and he, like, he even acknowledges that was stupid. And then he shoots the thing. So like, I think like that plays itself out. This is just, it's just a moment of humor for the audience. It's not, it's not something that they la they both laugh at together they just cut the scene at that. So yeah, it's, it's oddly contemporary, I guess in the, in the di- like that dialogue is like very of today's lingo or like the, the, yeah. the timing between those lines, like the, the one character acknowledging and the other character following and repeating the same line. Like exactly. Yeah. It, it, it kind of like smacks of like workaholics or something like that, you know, like just that kind of dialogue, which I actually, I, I like like, so, so I guess we could say we differ on that in that respect there. Like I do like the schlock and the cheese, um and like the modernization of the dialogue i guess as we we can call it like maybe the lord of millerization who knows yeah and it wasn't all humor i feel like they they, they did just cut out some of the stuff between the two of them which kind of lessens their relationship in, to a degree but at the same time one of my uh it, it's not so much a pet peeve it's just something i have noticed in repeated viewings of this movie is that their relationship seems really strong for having very little interaction with each other. Yeah, which is odd. Like that, I think that scene in the cockpit of the Tie Fighter is something that I really, over repeated viewings, have grown to dislike. When mm-hmm. he's like, "Well, my name's this," blah blah blah. I was like, "What's your name?" FN two one eight seven. Oh, well, yeah. You know what? I'm not going to use that. I'm going to call you Finn. Like that. I was like, that was very quick you know, decisions. Like I, I can't like, if I wanted like a more realistic scene, I probably would have had the characters not asking each other's names in yeah. that like crazy yeah, situation. I mean, like, I mean, think about it. Like <laughs> being on Finn's end of that conversation, like the stormtrooper who is like in the middle of this life changing decision to defect just allows this guy that he just rescued from prison to name him for life. He's yeah. Just, <laughs> and he just goes with the first name that he hears. Oh, that's weird to me. Now <laughs> in retrospect, <laughs> I feel kind of weird about that scene again. Oh boy. Oh, I don't. Okay. Let's not, let's not go there. But they didn't cut that out. They left that whole scene in, but they did remove some of the other stuff later. So like when, when, uh, when like Poe flies in with his fleet at, at Maz's place. Um, yeah. And you know, there's that line that I know you don't like where he says like, that's one hell of a pilot. I just thought it was just like so like I you know how I love starfighters and like dog yeah. fights and whatever so like that moment was really great for me watching Poe just, just slay tie fighters and whatnot and then like suddenly cut to Finn like that's one hell of a pilot Woo-hoo! I was just like is this like Independence Day like <laughs> like I felt like I was watching like a Michael Bay film all of a sudden 
Yeah. And and they cut that. And that was I was just like on my knees praising like the Star Wars, the edit <laughs> god and, and like being like, Yes, this is great. I'm so happy. Well that that's the thing. Like we're all thinking that. We're all watching that that sequence where they're like it's that tra- it's that tracking shot where it just shows like Poe decimating everything. And it you know, he's we're all thinking like, yeah, like holy cow, he's really good. And then this guy just comes in and he's just like well, that's that's one hell of a pilot. Yeah, it's it's like like young Anakin Skywalker <laughs> levels of obvious. Disgust. Yeah, like well, the thing's moving by itself. It's on autopilot. Yeah. Like it's like talking to it. It's like where the droid, you know, like and they have to repeat every like the the human character has to say everything that we're thinking, and that's what that right. line was to me. And I'm so glad they got rid of it. But yeah. I was also able to kind of like m- like move my mind to like another reason why it was cut, which is because a lot of Poe's uh, presence in this movie, like after he disappears on Jakku and, and, and like seemingly dies, you know, he's really not, not heard from again until that battle scene. But mm. in this battle scene in, in the edit, you also don't know it's Poe. So for, for that line to be in the edit with, with Finn yelling, that's one hell of a pilot in the movie, in the original version, that's kind of a wink, wink to the audience, being like this character no, Finn. I yeah, think I it think shows. It, I think it shows Poe as they're coming in, like when it when they're first coming in. It shows a shot of a bunch of the pilots, and I think it includes Poe. Not in the edit. No, I mean oh, you really? see the black unless you know that he has a black X wing. You, you it, it cuts out Poe's face and he, his communication with the group. There's just there's no yeah. So the first time you see Poe is is when Finn and him are reuniting. Ah, after, so he after the assault. he prolonged yeah. that reveal as well. Exactly. That's and that's um that that that's I think the actual reason for him getting rid of that's one hell of a pilot. Like it's sort of schlocky, sure, but it also in the original version it's a wink wink to the audience, being like, oh, this character Finn thinks that x-wing is doing really well so yeah. but he's comment like enough so to comment on how great the pilot must be so therefore oh it's like the audience would be like oh well why is he like it would just make the audience question why they felt the need to include somebody remarking on a pilot mm-hmm. and without the line it is preserves like the the like oh is this this is just an x-wing flying around this is just a like a senseless action scene i guess uh, you know and so yeah like you said uh, i guess we really don't see poe then until they're back at the resistance base and finn kind of runs out to meet him at his x-wing <laughs> and then they like cut most of that scene <laughs> yeah i thought I, I mean i don't know if they're trying to steer away from the finn and poe romance that is kind of brewing in internet forums but yeah they definitely cut that relationship yeah there's like nothing about him having his jacket or like any of that it's just um they just kind of cut it down to the the brass tacks and again it, it sort of makes finn more proactive like he he goes and meets poe and you know like obviously they're glad to see each other alive they kind of like rehash what they missed <laughs> um yeah. and then th- he's like okay now i gotta i gotta save this girl can you take me to leia that's, that's sort of the end of that there's some other stuff um well yeah there's there's that one the one more that i noticed i uh i tried to write like write notes of these things when i i missed them but i think in some cases they he probably did a pretty good job at editing out like small things i just probably wouldn't remember um but the one that i do recall is like when they bust into star killer base and they're kind of sneaking around and they're trying to find Ray so they can rescue her. Uh, they're kind of planning this action where they're going to bust through the door. And then uh, Han notices behind Finn that Ray is like scaling that wall. And this is the thing where like, you know, he's doing like the head nod and, um, and Finn does like the head nod thing back. He's like, what's, what's this? What, why are you doing this? And they just completely cut that out. Like he does the head, the one head nod and like Finn kind of like looks at him like what? And then it cuts to him like saying like, look. And I think that was actually a decent edit. That was, it, it's funny, but like if you're going to edit out the rest of the stuff before, you may as well take that out too. Yeah. You know what else they cut out? I know. Solo, we'll figure it out. We'll use the force. That's not how the force works. <laughs> Oh, really? You're cold? Oh, Come my on. gosh. They did. Yeah. I was waiting for it. Because, like, by that time, I'd gotten the pattern of how this whole thing was going. So I was mm-hmm. like, okay, they're going to get rid of anything that kind of would make an audience laugh out loud. And mm-hmm. sure enough, like, there's no, like, that's not how the force works. Like, the, like I guess don't have that in the movie. Uh, it's <sighs> They left in, like, a lot of the Han Solo humor, though. So, like, you know, like, did you just call me Solo? Like, they left all yeah. of his humor stuff in 
which is fine. I don't think like they overdid it with Han at all. I think I think they cut is... out the second one though when he says stop calling me solo. Like I told you, doesn't he say that again to Finn? Like I don't know second... because he. I did notice in this movie more that he continues to call him solo for a long time after. And I, like, I noticed I... <laughs> that there was no future scolding after the first one. I was like, well, yeah. I, I could have sworn there was another one. See, this is I, I just don't remember the original. See, yeah, one. this is the thing. This is the weird thing about <sighs> like this. So. Yeah, so between Poe and Finn, um, they probably cut, like, three minutes of the ten. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Which just goes to show you, like, the comic relief that we are experiencing through those characters. A lot of it was happening there. I mean, there was was other, like, I can't, I think, things that fell on, like, the line of humor versus, like, humor slash schlock slash, like, out of place, I guess, which was, um, like, the Kylo Ren tantrums. There's two major tantrums in this movie, and they cut out both of them. The first one after, uh, like, that poor dude, like, comes over and has to tell him that a girl had the droid, and and he's like, what girl? And they completely cut out the part where they <laughs> he takes out his lightsaber and demolishes the entire uh, computer system in front of him. Yeah, and, like, there's definitely a humorous aspect to that, but I, I feel like it services more in terms of... Uh... Like the the mysterious Kylo Ren that this editor yeah. wants to present. Well, yeah, I, I think the idea, the the main thread of this movie is to prolong the reveal of Kylo Ren, and in doing so, keep his character more sinister, more mysterious, um, definitely just like more evil, less mess, less like uh like reactive, and more um like contemplative and like you know actually like thinking about the, the, like his actions more more or less than just childlike rampages where he just destroys stuff because he's angry yeah i mean those were definitely displays of power but they were not like responsible displays of power or, like cool displays of power yeah like I, I mean i think a comparison can be drawn to like the infamous um Like that's not a cool display of power. Yeah. Like it's it's it certainly is an awesome showing, but like you're just seeing Darth Vader kind of like just making the world shake around him because he's mad that he killed his wife or whatever, or like mm-hmm. his wife died from sadness. I don't really know. Yeah, I mean, I like the tantrums. It's, it's another thing that was cut that I that I missed. Mm. You know, see, I um, hated them. That was I think we. How could we you hate about... that? I didn't. <sighs> We talked about this when we first reviewed the movie. I really didn't like Kylo Ren's character. I I still don't like. I think they he did. I think there is a better job done with this edit to kind of like make him something that I could uh, be interested in and sort of respect in a way. But like, it, he just seemed like a child, and I just didn't like that. Yeah, I don't know. I, I got to disagree with you there. I feel like um, I I I I think I don't want to rehash old discussions, but I, I really feel. Like like Kylo Ren needed to be that way, you know, for for whatever's coming next. But I I, I can understand how you can not like it, but I I just don't I, I like it. You know, I like him being a juvenile. Mm-hmm. I think it makes more sense in how in figuring out how Ray overpowers him at the end. If you think of Kylo Ren as a, as a you know like a, a Padawan of sorts, like a very powerful Padawan, maybe like a yeah kind of. I mean, he could be where you know he could be the dark side equivalent of Obi Wan in Episode One. Yeah, or episode, or episode two, maybe you know. That's a fair comparison. I'd say yeah. probably one. I mean, he's he's obviously Obi Wan's pretty strong in one. I mean, he killed Darth Maul. Yeah, yeah. So I feel like there's definitely like you can be a, like a fledgling still, and and yeah, or maybe like a, a novice, intermediate level Jedi and or Sith Lord. I don't even know what they call it now. We don't know yet. Hopefully, we get with some more like clarity on that stuff in episode eight. I imagine we will. Okay, so um, less childlike Kylo Ren. Um, I mean, let's 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 stick with the Kylo Ren thread because I okay. feel like because there's a, there's a lot of other stuff that comes like chronologically different. But let's talk about what they've done for Ren in this because um, I, I think the biggest thing that I was like like pumping my fist for was the fact that he doesn't take off his helmet until his final scene with Han. Yeah. I like that a lot. I like not seeing this dopey teenager in the interrogation scenes or in the chamber with Darth Vader's helmet. I, I like that. I, I, I love the mystery. I think one of the coolest parts of the original trilogy was Darth Vader's helmet, you know, coming off periodically. Like those, the two times I think in episode uh, five and six that it happens. 
like like holding my breath as the helmet is removed or as it's coming down when mm-hmm. he's being seen from behind in his little chamber thing. Um, and I think the parallel drawn is it, it makes it makes Kylo Ren's parallel to Darth Vader a little bit stronger to not see his face. I totally agree. Yeah, from a from a like a Disney you know Lucasfilm standpoint, I mean, how can you hide the face of Adam Driver? You know that that <laughs> weird, beautiful man face. Yeah, man boy face of Adam Driver. Well, with that, you know the by cutting out those scenes that have his face and there aren't that many of them, but there definitely are some, I think the most uh, prominent one in my mind is the Ray interrogation. She tells him to take his mask off. Right. In that scene. Well, yeah, she says that, you know, being hunted by a creature in a mask. Um, and then they basically cut the majority of that scene. I would say that's probably like a full, like almost minute of the edit was, was taking out the rest of that interrogation scene where he kind of looks at her mind the first time and sees the Island and Han Solo and I love that conversation. I thought that conversation was really good. Like the line about disappointment. The original conversation or the edited conversation? The original conversation. I love yes, the original yeah. one. Because that yeah. the line about disappointment, I thought that was really good. Obviously you can cut that out for two reasons, to save his face and also sort of that that glib uh remark that would indicate that in fact Han is his father, so they had to, right. to cut that, that that out too. But um I don't know. That that was one edit that I, I didn't it made sense for the goals, but it was one that I didn't necessarily love just because I'm I'm particularly fond of that scene. Yeah. Um, I, I, I get it again, though, like the like by see, uh, I'm hearkening back to the original edit, I guess, again, the, the original version of the movie mm-hmm. where you see uh, Adam Driver's face. And I think like along with it, taking like taking out the tantrums and the edit by showing an immature Kylo Ren by showing a baby faced, I guess, I possibly like, I guess Adam Driver can be considered baby face. He's a young <laughs> dude. Um, by seeing a young person behind the mask, you are effectively illustrating this character as young yeah. and, and, and like inexperienced, whatever. But with the edits version, by not showing his face and by taking out the tantrums, you're getting a character who is possibly like wiser than like you don't, you can't really gauge Just more mature. Yeah, you can't. Ha- you, there's not as many preconceived notions you can have about this person. Like you see him talking smack to General Hux about the clone army still, mm-hmm. and like kind of questioning those kind of things. So like you don't know if this dude is more Darth Vader than anything, and he's like praying to Darth Vader still. He calls him grandfather, which we'll get to later. Um, it, you know, it's just um, I get it. I get why there there's there's an argument to be made for having a mask on for most of the movie versus showing his face for most of the movie and. There are meta reasons why in terms of like showing like a actor's contract saying they have to have their face shown for a certain amount of time or whatever, you know, like who knows, but mm-hmm. there's a, but there's plot reasons too. And I, I kind of can see all sides of this here. And I, but I, I, for one still like the tantrum Kylo Ren and I still like the having his helmet on for the entire movie, except the end. No, I like that too. I, I thought that worked. Um, but as, as far as like cuts go, like there was, there was more too. obviously they cut out like a lot of lines that pertain to Kylo Ren, whether it was between Ren and Snoke or between Han and Leia talking about their son. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. Why, why don't you talk on that? Cause I, I think you probably had, you probably, I think you noticed more of these than I did. Yeah, I, I can speak specifically to the, the Han and Leia stuff because I remember in the theater really disliking their dialogue um, at, at the base or whatever, before they went to the, the third act mm-hmm. talking about like, we both had to deal with it in our own way. I went back to the only thing I was ever any good at. We both did. We lost our son. Forever. No way. It was Snoke. He seduced our son to the dark side. What is all this exposition? Like this casual exposition, like two thirds of the way through a movie, trying to give me backstory with just two characters talking about it. Like I really did not like that happening. And Mm. a lot of that was cut and again comes in that like the fan edit aspect of it where like there's a couple weird like mishmashing of lines and sections of like them talking about their child together ben mm-hmm. ben solo calling him by his name you know um but it, i i liked that they didn't have that like crazy exposition and i felt like removing that dialogue gave a little bit more um believability 
to their like estrangement, I guess, Han and Leia's estrangement. Right. So in this movie, when or in this edit, when when would you say the reveal happens? On the bridge. Okay. So here here's my argument for why I don't feel like these edits necessarily worked. And I after rereading his goals and kind of seeing that his intention was to misdirect, I don't I still don't see it because like between like in the in the scene where uh Han and Leia are talking, um they're talking about how they want him back. They want their son back. Like who else could they be talking about? But they don't say son, do they? Who else who are well yeah, they they're, want they're... him back. Well, I mean if cuz if Luke is missing, they're they're probably his guardian, you know, or something like that. I mean, it's to say probably is is a stretch in itself. So I I can't nothing's going to be perfect here. But um if I was to be watching this movie with fresh eyes, yeah, like this is where it would start to start to get to kind of like fuzzy, being like who is talking about who? Like the misdirect yeah. is this is starting to be like a little hazy area okay. where you don't really know where they're going. So I agree, yeah, it gets it gets fuzzy here, but I still see the the him yelling Ben on the bridge as like a really great moment of clarity. Right. So they cut a lot of Kylo Ren, but they also added some Kylo Ren. Oh yeah, yeah. You're talking about the deleted scenes. Yeah, they they added that deleted scene with Kylo Ren on the Falcon, which I think is awesome. I like that scene. It what it didn't add like a lot, but it did put him in the Falcon, which I thought it was sort of important in a way. Um, it put him back in that nostalgic space before the big scene, you know? Mm. And I, I thought that gave some good context. And I, I think it fit. I think the editor did a really good job at fitting it exactly where it needed to be in the movie because, you know, the end of that scene, he walks out of the Falcon, he looks up, he sees the X-Wings coming in and then it just cuts to the like zoom ups on the X wings and the pilots. So I thought that was, it was, it was added. Well, I think the coloring was a little bit off, but I, yeah, definitely needed some processing. It's, it's so, it's so hard to match that stuff up when it's, you know, taken out of context like that. But yeah, I, I don't know. Like it's, um, that scene, the thing about Kylo Ren and like, I guess Darth Vader in general, which many, uh, like parody editors have had fun with over the years is like, you can do whatever you want with this character's voice and dialogue mm-hmm. because you can't see his mouth move. <laughs> so yeah. I, so you get, you get, I feel like you could tell me, cause I don't think I've watched this deleted scene, um, in its entirety. I've seen screenshots of it and like read about it, but like when he walks into the Falcon and he kind of like moves around the cockpit and he's just like Han Solo and he just like says his, his like Han Solo's name. Yeah. Was there any dialogue? Was that the only actual piece of dialogue? That was it. And I think that's why they cut it. Cause it, it, it wasn't like important to the movie, but I think it works in this context. Like I can see why he thought to add it back in because it does make sense to, to give the, a little bit more um, background and, and like a, a little bit of like, connectivity between the two of them like it when it when that big reveal happens though like it's like i think it adds something to it i i think it adds something too but i don't think i think it it's weird because i think it connects the characters but not in the way that like father and son i think you know calling your dad by his first and last name is is like you know it's it it signals some odd distance you know i mean think about luke you know like calling out to Vader, you know, like father, you know, yeah. in various points of, of, uh, return of the Jedi. Um, and you know, like for Kylo Ren to walk into the Falcon and say like Han Solo, I think it works with the misdirect that the editor was going for in a unique way. Cause the, I mean, I don't see a lot of other fan edits where it would be necessary to put that in. Right. It's, I mean, it just look, it's this extra footage in general and like kind of a weird kind of oh, close to fan service moment, you know, like, yeah. Like, I feel like more Falcon, the more, more Falcon, the more better for the fans at least. But like, I, I it, you're right. It, that scene doesn't really serve a lot of purpose in the main movie besides kind of like tugging at your heartstrings or like, it adds more questions like, in the main movie because how the hell did Chewie get the Falcon back after the first order? Like, <laughs> I mean, obviously there's a ton of first order people there. Like they, they would have done something with the Falcon. They wouldn't have just like, so, right. okay there's nobody here let's just leave it yeah let's just leave it <laughs> i mean you, you gotta figure like I mean, anything could happen but like you, yeah. i mean chewie can probably take two stormtroopers you know on his own right so apart from that um the snow hologram what do you think about that i kind of like the the way the, the force awakens the original version kind of put like giant 
25 foot tall man mm-hmm. on screen and i think i forget at what point he it becomes clear he's a hologram is that uh, it's when he end? leans down he like kind of like leans over when he says something because he's kind of like leaning back in the chair and it just it it's not obvious that he's a hologram it's not until uh his figure leans into that light that's coming down from the ceiling that you can see yeah. that the light's just passing through I like that. It's kind of another weird misdirect in the original, mm-hmm. and I like the idea of a giant 25, 30-foot-tall man just existing in this place. Yeah, I don't know. I The retro hall effect is fine. Um, I didn't think it was, like, super necessary. It's, like, it's just... It, I mean, obviously, like, holog- sure, hologram technology is going to change, you know? Like, I think that's not, like, a huge leap for the viewer. I don't think anybody like really watches that scene and thinks like, Oh, that's not how the holograms sh- should work. I don't know. Maybe they do. And maybe, you know what? Who knows? Maybe I even thought that the first time I saw it, but I definitely don't think that now. And it didn't look bad. I think they did a good job with the, the composite, but yeah, I mean, I almost feel like he was just trying to like flex on that one. Like yeah, maybe he was, was. like I he do. was just trying to like see, no, maybe not flex, but just like see how far he could go with it, test his, his skills or something like that. I could have yeah. done without it. Like it, it's not something that bothered me in the original movie or, and in this movie it wouldn't have seemed out of place. Yeah. I mean, maybe the size of a blue hologram like that would have been weird to me, but mm. uh, like if I hadn't, if I had actually thought about it, but it, it, it didn't, go either way for me on this in this one and in the original trilogy when they're you when those holograms do appear it's always clear what the hologram is emanating from mm-hmm. and in yeah, this edit, yeah. it was not clear what the hologram was emanating from which is why i think the newer hologram effect probably worked better yeah definitely i agree although yeah i mean maybe we have a lot to learn about the new hologram technology or whatever but <laughs> yeah hmm I mean, there's a, a, do you want to continue in the retro effects category? Yeah, um, for sure. With, well, I mean, the, 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 what comes to mind is the, uh, the Falcon turrets. Yeah. I, I thought that was okay. Yeah. Those are some things that I wish that had been included. I mean, there are obviously modifications to the Falcon, uh, since the end of Return of the Jedi, mm-hmm. namely like the satellite on top that got knocked off during the second, uh, Death Star run. Mm-hmm. Um, so I imagine maybe like, the sound effects changed because the turrets changed too. Who knows? Like, in, there's a lot of time that's passed. Yeah. Um, but but I think that uh, like it was the head the, the the heads up display that like Finn has to deal with when mm-hmm. he's shooting those Tie Fighters. It was never really clear to me what I was looking at in A New Hope. Uh, I imagine I imagined it was like a weird 3D rendering of a Tie Fighter, but it could have been like a weird like 3D space grid or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, targeting right I, I don't know what but it was nice seeing it there it would have i i i i'm kind of like leaning i i'm on a fence on this one because like it would have struck like struck me as almost too fan servicey it would have been like rogue one territory which i feel was like relying on on like nostalgia and fan service for most of it mm-hmm. um versus like oh that's kind of cool to see that the the falcon hasn't changed you know like i, I can't decide which i, I would have liked to see in the final official Lucasfilm cut of the force awakens. I, I did see one thing when just kind of looking through the section of the movie and the edits that he edited out Finn's cursing with a grunt just because it was his personal, personal preference to not have swearing. What, what, what does he say? I, guess, I don't remember, but I, there's yeah, no he does... cursing in star Wars. Damn. Is it that? Yeah, I would say, yeah. I mean, there's no, it F definitely word, doesn't but... say sh- you know like there's no way that i mean it might not be like a swear it. word i don't know but you know he he cursed to some degree but he replaced it with a grunt i just i just looked that now i didn't notice it yeah <laughs> huh one thing i did notice has nothing to do with the edit but like nothing i it's something i never really thought about before um so the falcon in space when they're doing all the flips and stuff it doesn't have any bearing on the direction that the people inside have like because there's you know theoretically some sort of like artificial gravity within the ship that gives them you know some weight yeah but in this one and maybe it's because they're on the planetary like within the atmosphere but there's that shot where like uh where, or, BB-8. or bb8 he like fastens yeah. himself to the wall because he keeps like sliding around and like falling in all these directions but the pilot and the gunner are not buckled in yeah, like why aren't I, they falling all over the there's place? A, there's a lot of like weird that that's pretty inconsistent, and I feel like but that's you like could explain it away. Well, I, I had a long discussion with my roommate about because we were watching um, some Star Trek stuff, and mm-hmm. I had a question. 
Oh, you know what we were watching? Holy crap. This is going to be embarrassing to admit. We were, we watched the pilot of that show, uh, The Orville, that new Seth MacFarlane live action Star Trek comedy yeah, yeah, yeah. that's on Fox now. I just saw it on like Hulu, so we just like threw in the first episode just to see what it was like. Not impressed, but um, there was some like weird uh, outer space physics stuff. And uh, Pat, my roommate's like a huge Star Trek nerd, um, and he, I was like, wait, so like, how do they, how do they explain inertia in outer space and like gravity in these ships when they're doing like crazy maneuvers, like what we were watching in this pilot? Mm-hmm. And um, he talked about like how there's anti grav generators or like it, there's yeah. I, he had he he actually took out the 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 manual like the Star Trek. <laughs> uh what's it called uh the enterprise manual that yeah. like gives like hard numbers on like like gravity displacement fields and everything like that and like oh it's built into the paneling of the ship so like transferring that to star wars which is almost pointless because star wars is science fantasy not science fiction um <laughs> you could hypothesize that maybe that like where BB-8 was in the ship, the panels were not working because there was something wrong with the ship. Uh, and in the cockpit, it was like the dis- the gravity displacement, whatever, inertial dampeners were working in the cockpit and the gunner pit. Who knows? There's yeah. no way to tell. But okay. um, but yeah, I mean, that's how they explain it in Star Trek is like there's technology that ex- like exerts force. Huh. Uh, and that's why like this is actually it's actually kind of cool to talk about with star trek i feel bad that we're doing it in the star wars podcast but whatever like <laughs> it that they explain it in such a way that like you know how in the old the original star trek series when like it's like all right bang to the right or like whatever you know like hard to port and everybody in the the cockpit the camera tilts and everybody kind of leans to one side they're like they explain the inertial dampeners in such a way that like so like it 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 <sighs> sudden movements are not detectable by those dampeners so like it it uses like predicted like it uses like smart predictions i guess to figure out which way the field should be dampened so like course plotting and everything it knows where to project the gravity to make sure that nobody's like stumbling around Mm -hmm. but when you have to like crazy evasive maneuvers or something like that that's why when the dampeners can't keep up so it's like essentially lag in the processing of these these inertial dampeners things huh anyway that's my star trek moment for this star wars podcast <laughs> well thank you for explaining that for me <laughs> yeah for this this element I, I wouldn't of... have thought i actually wouldn't have thought of that <laughs> like i i thought it would might it might have more to do with uh with just like the atmospheric gravity in relation to how things generally work in the falcon in space yeah i don't think anybody in star wars is concerned with science at yeah. all <laughs> no probably and and for good reason yeah there's just too much. I yeah. like trying to talk about lightsabers. That's for a different episode, I think. But lightsabers are a cool discussion. Unlike what, like, if you just held a lightsaber at your waist, pointed down, ignited <laughs> it, and dropped it, how like would it reach the center of the planet that you're on? It would just fall forever. Like, what can it cut through? Well, it can't cut through everything. Like, not right away. Remember when it took uh, it took Qui Gon a couple a couple of tries like a, a couple of minutes actually to get through that like d- set of double doors but in, like uh, he pushed it through so like how like i, I guess the question yeah. becomes what rate would a lightsaber fall to the center of like any body well, of any mass you know I, I mean theoretically it could go forever because I, I like to think of it as like a think of it like a like a bandsaw <laughs> and it'll it'll keep cutting like it, it takes a while and you have to like you have to allow some material to remove itself so that you still have room to continually like you know like go at it and there needs to be like room for friction but <laughs> that's a, what i mean like there's like a, a, a blade lot would of dull great, <laughs> there's a lot of great science questions in star wars that just should like can't be addressed because it would just like, I feel like Star Trek, it's fun to talk about science. And in mm-hmm. Star Wars, it's like, oh, this makes this not as fun to watch if we talk about science in this. Yeah. But there are YouTube channels dedicated to doing exactly that for Star yeah. Wars. Yeah. Someday, that that would be a good episode. We should just kind of, like, jump into a couple of those and they highlight some creators that are, or, like, some some contributors to that that field of study. Yeah. Um, all right. Back to this edit. We, this is a good tangent. I like it. I'm keeping it in, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good, uh, it's a, definitely a tangent uh any other like um like retro stuff so they did the stuff to the falcon did you notice any like musical cue changes this is again like i just haven't watched the original in so long so like i definitely felt like some of the music was off uh when uh han confronts kylo ren at the end of it 
like I felt like it felt like the music cue was off. Like it mm-hmm. wasn't as momentous, but I also can't see the editor being able to manipulate the music. I did a, I did a little search through his notes just to like look for some keywords. And apart from the initial music and the opening of the film and the Fox fanfare and that, that cheeky little, uh, that 20th century Fox title card that he made with the Walt Disney, like, you know, the big 20th century Fox, uh, like, like statue. I'm not sure what it's supposed to be, but has like the lights flashing. Yeah. Across yeah. It. The, he, yeah, he made sure. a new one that said like Walt Disney instead and then he put in the fox fanfare i thought that was funny um but it doesn't look like he did any other like musical edits not that i can find at first glance there's so many notes here there's 75 changes yeah i mean i I imagine it would be really difficult to edit music without having like the original like the mix you know like right because you got lines right you have dialogue and so you can't really manipulate the music so i guess it just i anything i perceived was imagined than any any odd Things or... Well, he did add the music during uh, during the speech, the the big uh, Hitler speech. He added um, he added some score there just to kind of give it some gravitas. Interesting. I, I didn't pick up on that. It didn't strike me as odd. So I guess another good seamless edit from Dig Modification. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just call him Dig for short? All right, I'll call him Dig for the rest of this. Yeah. Oh, so okay. during Hux's thing, he actually, this is the, the song that he added. I'll put it in the show notes. It's actually a piece of the soundtrack from The Forced Unleashed 2. So he, I guess he uses a lot of the, the Forced Unleashed soundtrack, or like, maybe not a lot, but like two things. Look at point sixty two on his uh, edit list there. Interesting. Yeah. So I guess he just paid, probably just took any scenes without music in the back of it and just kind of just snuck in some Forced Unleashed stuff. I guess, and and this is something we'll see uh, when we talk about the Rogue One edit that he did, is uh, he actually added in a lot of uh, Williams scores, and I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, Giancino, I think, the original composer for... for Rogue One, he's he adds back in some of his stuff from past films or something like that. I we'll see, we'll see when we both watch that. I've only watched eight minutes of the Rogue One edit, um, but from what I've watched so far, I actually like it more than Rogue One. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so apart from okay, like the Luke ending, I don't think much needs to be said about that. I think his uh, his justification for removing that actually make, does make sense. If it's going to be the first scene in the next movie, uh, it doesn't really do a whole lot to ruin this one. Um, it, t- it takes out the MacGuffin ending. He ends it at the shot where, uh, they're blasting off into hyperspace to go find Luke. I think it actually made it a little more cinematic. Um, it did. You know what it reminded me of is the end of, uh, Rogue One, the original Rogue One. <laughs> oh, you know how Rogue One just kind of ends with that Corvette just kind of like blasting off and then yes. shoot credits like immediately. Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. Like Rogue One struck me as a fan at it in itself. You know, the ending <laughs> of this felt like, like I wish, like you could tell it was definitely, he was, he had to work with the source material. He didn't have, he had to, he had to do what he could with it. So like, it, like Ray, the Falcon goes to hyperspace and roll credits, but it was like just as abrupt as the Rogue One ending. And I wish they had like made it a little bit more dramatic, or like the angle of the hyperspace jump had been like directly from behind the Falcon, as opposed to kind of like that weird three quarters angle or perspective that we had on the yeah. Falcon as it jumps. I forget. I think it did it from um, within side. Did it? Yeah. Did it show? Did it throw a, like a, a third? I think it jumped from outside. The, the the cockpit. We, okay. I might have to just like watch it again afterwards. But again, you called me during that scene, so I, I... yes. <laughs> <laughs> sorry if I distracted you from the, the most crucial point of the movie, the end. I'm sorry, um, I wasn't more prepared early on. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It, it, when I was doing my notes, um, I was. I mean, I I kind of described that as like my initial reaction was that the ending had been kind of maimed, but yeah. that but after like a, a couple moments of reflection, I was like, this is probably how it should have ended. You know, like. Now yeah. we, you know, say what you will, like, like, love it or hate it, like, about what's going to happen with episode eight, where it picks up right where, you know, episode uh, seven left off. You know, like, we ha- now we have this, like, regardless of how you feel about it, we have a huge stylistic difference mm-hmm. that is now being enacted. And in past episodes, I've said I'm fine with it, and I'm still fine with it. Yeah. But it makes more sense. Like, why stir up the controversy? It makes more <laughs> sense, you know, like, yeah. to do it the way this editor did it. You know, 
I, I feel like that's almost like the entire reason this fan edit exists is because like this weird discontent stirred up like with the idea of episode eight picking up where episode left off. Like that's the stirrings of of kind of like people who want to do something about what they're being presented with, you know, yeah. by Lucasfilm. Um, so that that, I, that from that ending, I feel spawns this entire idea of fan editing this movie i'm looking forward to this particular editor's edit of episode eight just to see how he edits together <laughs> how he starts the, it yeah because <laughs> i mean he's gonna have to take like they're not in in episode eight they're not gonna put in the scenes where like she's going up the stairs you know landing and going up the stairs so he'd have to edit that why in. not oh like he's gonna start the movie at the confrontation I think. We, we we did an episode on this like yeah. how like i think my <laughs> thought was that they were going to pan down right from the crawl or something <laughs> yeah. oh we had ideas about how like no we we it was gonna be a pre it was gonna be a pre-crawl intro right which is something weird. like that yeah but but we talked about that yeah it's gonna it's gonna be weird no matter what like how yeah. no matter how you cut it it's gonna be weird and i i see no seamless way or like stylistic way to blend this into the other film this is gonna be something totally different different yeah i agree um so, so yeah he's he, you're right he's probably gonna take the edit from episode seven the end of it and and slap it onto the beginning of episode which would be so much better like like i would have been fine like if they hadn't hyped luke being like recast in episode seven so much i would have only been like a little bit disappointed at the end mm-hmm. not having seen luke like it does make for a great moment yeah uh but it's almost like a second climax you know like it's just like yeah a, like like the big moment ends weird and pacing. then there's yeah, yeah exactly it feels strange and i think it makes sense in this edit i understand why he did it i guess you know that's like the last big edit of this thing but there was there's one more like through line that i kind of wanted to talk about uh and we can branch it off into a couple different things but the r2d2 coma <laughs> <laughs> It's like completely eliminated from this movie. The, the depression, the droid depression. Yeah, like they completely took it out. Like, R2- Wait, do you remember how we figured this out? Like, I, I texted you <laughs> while I'm watching this movie because I'm watching the the kind of the war room scene where they're mm-hmm. planning again about how to how to attack Star Killer and and I'm looking at this this cutaway to BB-8 and behind him is this little R2D2 and and it swirls. I'm like, wait a second, and I paused it and and took a a, a, a video of it and sent it to you. I'm like was this in the original movie? Is this shot from the original? And, uh, I guess it wasn't because like, it wasn't just another R2 unit sitting behind BB-8. I don't think like it was very clearly R2-D2. I, I don't know. I, I could be wrong. No, you're wrong. Uh, point 41 added R2-D2 visually to the checking the map sequence. Also added R2 beeps and sad sounds. He is now seen heard active and present. Oh, so I'm right then. Yeah, you're he, right. They cut okay. they cut the scene immediately after that where BB-8 goes up to R2 and, you know, C-3PO gives some exposition about why R2 okay. is sad. Okay. And instead he just like adds him to that one scene in the background. <laughs> so that scene that I videotaped and sent to you or yeah. like filmed on my phone, I guess, um, that was from the end of the movie, right? Where they're looking at Luke's star map, I guess. Like no, this, I think he he actually composited R two D two. I don't the believe scene. that. He, no it way. says here added R two D two visually to the checking the map sequence. That's insane. Yeah, he composited, but R two D 2s head swivels in the back of that. Yeah, I mean, it, he probably took it from like some other. Maybe it was from this movie. Maybe it was from something else. He didn't list anything else as a source. Like his in, everything that he has for a source. Um, is from that Blu-ray, I guess, except for those, uh, those no songs. No way. He can, I don't know. See, there's no way that's a composite shot. That's so good. I feel like we should post this or something like that. Like, I, I, like I have the, the clip still saved on my phone. I'll, I, I, I'll, I'll take out the actual clip. I'll make a fancy GIF of it or something. But Well, I sent... Yeah, I sent you the... Yeah, okay, because I sent you a little like video of it on my yeah. TV. But well, I'll, I'll, but, I'll just take it straight from the video. We'll look at that. But then there's, there's another thing later, 68... Um, this is interesting. He cut 3PO's line where he says, R2, D2, you've come back. And instead, he now says, come along, you two. Talking oh, now yeah. to R2, D2, and BB-8. But yeah, he that was a fake this. voice, right? No. That he, was real? Yeah, he took it from the 2016 Oscars speech. Wow. 
Wow. How, how do you <laughs> how did he be <laughs> how do you even think to like grab that Oscar speech? That's I, like I I would have gone digging in the Clone Wars. I would have gone digging anywhere besides a Oscar speech. Holy crap. Yeah, kudos to him. I wouldn't have even thought of that. That's so stupid. <laughs> a, a, a good move. Excellent. Excellent work. Excellent work on on Dig Digs thing. Great work, Dig. <laughs> Dirk Diggler. Dig Dunker. Um um, yeah, so I mean that. Yeah, the, the droid depression coma. So stupid. Hated that. Yet Glad they left they in it. that stupid line where where C three PO talks about his his arm. Oh yeah, that was. I like, so, couldn't have cut like, that. Talk about schlock and cheese. Like that could. I mean, that would have been difficult to cut. But like, I, I feel like you could have done it. Like you could have just had that shot of like <laughs> the two of them walking out of the ship, and then just kind of like cut even just to like Han looking their direction for a moment, and then like you know cut it to her kind of sidling up or something i don't know you know what i would have done i would have um okay i would have done the r2 the the c3po saying hi and like busting into the scene to say hi to everybody and then i would have cut to a n- at the next scene but i would have taken the audio from the c3po introduction and put like a, a weird like effect on it like a reverb effect to make it seem like it was off screen and i would have panned it uh, left or right there and kind of made like whatever unimportant thing that C-3PO is saying is like off screen dialogue that is not actually being heard or the focus of the next scene. Like it's just like moving yeah. in, like a transition scene. That's what I would have done if I had all the resources available to me, like to make that audio edit. And yeah, that's what I would have done. But, but anyway, you, you know, this is our next, our next big project. Mike is our own fan uh, at it. No, I, I, <laughs> I don't have the patience for that. I don't have the patience or the, or like the, the desire. Or yeah, like, neither do I. I, got so the, I have on. no motivation to change Star Wars right now. Like, like yeah. to actually do something about it. I'm just here to complain about it and be annoying. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not, I think I'm doing pretty good this time. I'm not complaining too much. No, um, you're doing a great job, Mike. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Um, okay. So are the droid coma, um, you, did you like the droid coma? Uh, no, I didn't. I thought it was pointless. I thought it was, I, I really do think it's silly that at the end of the movie, like, oh, like R2 D2 had the rest of the map the whole time. Like, I mean, I just, I just feel like that's, that's very silly. Um, I, I feel like it's cause what was the <sighs> catalyst? What, what is the, what is the trigger for R2 D2 to wake up? Like, right. Yeah. What, like what triggered him? What, like alerted him to the fact that you know this needed was it bba he was needed was it... here here's another thought related i was actually i was thinking about this while doing dishes the other day and i thought maybe you'd have some good thoughts on this prior to the force awakens how much personality did droids have well c-3po has a ton of personality does he though like i i think i feel like his character is it feels like it has personality because he's annoying because he just keeps talking but like uh i'm I'm talking more about like uh like emotions like droids having emotions but prior to the force awakens how much of that can you like pick out and recall i think of like r2d2 on dagobah what, how was r2d2 like what emotions on on dagobah and specifically yeah like when he'd be like swimming in the water with a little periscope up he was kind of like humming along and then gets attacked by the thing and screams so definitely some personality i mean even think about like the little uh little like i don't know what do you call that like little rc car that like road like goes around the death star or something mm-hmm. like that and chewy growls at it and it, like backs up and goes away really quickly like fear I mean that that's a that thing doesn't have a face, but it yeah. was able to exhibit fear with, okay. like, between a sound effect and a thing. So I, I feel like it's always kind of been there. Okay, I was just I was thinking about this because I just you know like BB-8 is probably like the most emotive of all droids. You know he's he has the most like outward personality. He has lots of different noises. He does thumbs up. He you know he, yeah like, that's true. Is immediately like crestfallen and like emotionally destroyed when finn tells him that poe is no longer with us <laughs> he's, a bit, he's a bit more anthropomorphic than yeah um, i mean he doesn't have eyes i mean he has eyes i guess you can see his eyes but there's no mouth and or any but he gets hands yeah from the, like that little blowtorch thing um but i mean i think another part of that is the didn't bill Hader do the voice you know a quotation mark of bb8 like from what i understand he and i think one other person kind of like he- came up yeah. with like, weird noises and they synthesized the noises that bill Hader was able to make bb8 was voiced by bill Hader and ben schwartz yeah huh yeah i think that definitely adds to the emotion that uh, of it is like having a voice actor there there is personality i just feel with the force awakens there was more droid 
emotion and that's where like i i feel like bb8 was okay and like i could give all of that a pass and like it seemed okay like natural but when they put r2d2 in an emotionally induced coma <laughs> i just thought that was a little bit too far like i i it just it wasn't it didn't add anything to the movie for me like it's supposed to make you feel bad for r2d2 but <laughs> like also i could have done with out r2d2 in the movie you know what i mean like I, I didn't feel like he needed to be there for us to feel bad that luke is missing like that's it's enough of a like a, a through line through this movie like obviously that's an important thing um and maybe that does make r2d2 sad but like do, does it have to make him so sad that he just like is asleep or or like is r2d2 asleep because luke told him to be until they found the rest of the map or something, but that's, that's just stupid. No, cause we get the rest of the map before star killer base is blown up when BB eight comes back and they show it to the resistance. So like, yeah, like, so what is actually waking <laughs> BB eight up? Like, is, like, is R2 D2, like, yeah, right. like what, like, like I feel like maybe they'll try and explain it in episode eight when like, when Luke says hi to R2 D2 again, like, cause I mean, Luke clearly, I mean, in the, in the weird, uh, like Ray's visions, like you see Luke's Luke like saying kind of like I mean, maybe maybe saying goodbye to, to R2D2 or something like that. Like yeah. Platinum. yeah. So I mean, there's not it's not like they hate each other or something like that. It's not like something bad happened between them that we know of. Um, it's but I, I'm I'm sure they'll try and explain what happened to R2D2. I don't know if they will. I don't know if they'll give <sighs> give it that much screen time. I don't. I it's honestly I don't think it's that weird... big of a deal. But it, it's it's just a weird thing. It's a plot hole to me. Like it's just yeah. it, it's like why. How, why did he wake up then? Yeah. So good thing to edit out, I think. Yes, very good thing. I was glad they got rid of it. All right. So to, to kind of wrap up on this, do you think that this edit made good on its intentions? Do you think it did what it set out to do? Um. Yes, I do. I think it. I think given the limited resources that that Dig had, <laughs> um. Yes, I think I think they made good on it. I think he did everything it set out to do. And I think given unlimited resources and reshoot abilities, this would be the Star Wars. Like, a, most of the things... I would keep in all the schlock and the cheese, because I love cheesy schlock. Um, but given the ability to reshoot and the ability to re-edit dialogue and ADR and just do all those dialogue lines over again, I would prefer most of this version of the film. If it was like all the weirdness of the edits and like, if the script was actually be able, if the script is written around Kylo Ren and that misdirect, if someone had written a script rather than just try to mishmash dialogue together from different scenes and cut out dialogue to make it this weird misdirect work, I would have liked that more than what was given to me in the film in the original. What do you think? Uh, overall, I think, it it did set out to do a lot of the things that it meant to. I think it actually improved um, Finn's character more for me than it did necessarily Kylo's. But I think that they did do a really good job at at limiting the things that annoyed me about Kylo Ren. It did make him more mysterious. It did uh, sort of give him a little more maturity, which I think gave him more gravitas in the film. It really did make him seem like more of a threat. Uh, mm, yeah. I wonder if it's possible to have the misdirect and the Kylo Ren not taking his helmet off with that, uh, that tan with the, the childlike thing, you know, like, cause like I did like that he didn't take his helmet off. I did like kind of this weird power that he, he seemed to have, or like this, this maturity that he seemed to have, but I also really liked his tantrum, you know? Yeah. I, yeah, this is again, like just this kind of impasse I'm at with that. I think my only, um, my only qualm with this fan edit is that they didn't edit in any footage from Matt, the radar technician. What's that? The skit from SNL. Oh yeah. (laughs) But again, you know, this guy apparently doesn't like comedy. So what if they just intersperse that that throughout (laughs) the thing? Just Kylo Ren trying to figure out how people on Starkiller base. Yeah, just uh, just in just like really weird like it. breakfast club edits, just like flashing to like little weird like quick jokes before going back to another conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think they did a great job. I 
I think that honestly, like the the sound cues that they changed didn't distract me from the film at all. I think any of the music that they add uh, seemed like a fairly natural fit. I did honestly, I didn't even notice that that music didn't belong in that scene with uh, with Hux giving the speech. I thought that was actually pretty good. It's a good pick. The Falcon effects, good call. I think um, definitely those should have been there originally. Yeah, I'd like that. Uh, the ending, I. I I think we both agree that that was uh, a good pick for this edit and probably um, could have been okay for the the normal film as well. Overall, pretty impressed. This is uh, the first fan edit I've actually ever watched. I We talked about oh, a the bunch of them. And, and, oh, uh, like ever? Ever. Never I mean, like the, the, no. I've, I've downloaded the like the Phantom edit before, or not the Phantom edit, like the, the really short cut of episode one. I've yeah. watched that. Of course, I watch the Harmy edits exclusively for the original trilogy, but I don't necessarily consider them fan edits so much as reconstructions. Yeah, I consider those like definitive almost in like how the movie should be viewed. Exactly. You know? Yeah, and there are other ones like other reconstructions that I want to watch, but they're like scholarly projects, you know, as opposed to like a fan edit. And they take so much time. Not that this didn't, but like the amount of sourcing, like of of different formats and and. Uh, and, and the technologies that he's done to restore certain aspects of like, um, you know, like film there, there are those other reconstructions that completely uh, like physically, like frame by frame restore cells from original like, that. tapings. I, it's out there. I need to get it. I, I've been meaning to, um, I'll find that and maybe we could do an episode on that later. But as far as fan edits go, like I've been wary because, you know, a lot of them are pretty amateurish and I'm not going to download one without reading a little bit on it already like you know there have been a couple of reviews on this one on fanedits.org and people have been talking about it on uh the places where i find these things and uh this one seemed to be pretty good and the goals that they set in the initial post um aligned with things that i would want to see uh so i think this is a this would probably be a good introductory fan edit for most people i mean i I haven't watched any other ones but it it worked for me i enjoyed it i actually thought it it uh it added something to the story and by detraction and um i'd watch it again i wouldn't necessarily like replace the original movie with this but uh it's an interesting thing to sort of experience i guess I guess I, I to add to my review of it, I, I would not watch it again, yeah. <laughs> uh, which is to be expected from me. Um, <laughs> no, I, I would probably watch the original version over yeah. this one just because of just the togetherness of it and mm-hmm. and, uh, and the cohesiveness of the original. I, I don't think I could watch this fan edit again in like the, the jumpiness and the, uh, the, 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 like I mentioned, the cognitive dissonance that I have mm-hmm. to kind of like the, the mental state I have to put myself in of like not thinking about what's missing yeah um so i yeah i would probably stick to the original after seeing this once but it was good and i, I don't know if i was just to kind of like say one thing in general about these two edits that we're going to be discussing um is is really just like the discussion that it's opened up for me amongst like my peers that also enjoy star wars besides yourself obviously um mm. like my, my roommate and i just started dishing like after he had watched the original and i had watched the edit you know we convened and we're kind of talking about what the differences were and we started talking it just opened my eyes to like the problems that are in the force awakens Mm -hmm. and and how much i like yeah like i love the force awakens i think it's great but there are there are things that i wish had gone differently things that can't be just edited away in a fan edit like just massive right. rewrites that i wish had happened like the idea of star killer base in general like <laughs> what a stupid idea oh but, i mean like it, how how well executed it was it was so good and and, and well executed in the film like it, it looked fantastic and mm-hmm. you know they justified it well enough like in the terms of the plot but like I would have preferred a different threat. I would prefer to see mm-hmm. a weak first order, like a weaker first order in this movie. And then in episode eight, I, I want to see a really powerful first order, kind of like Empire Strikes Back, Mirror, you know. But I, I, in Ep- Force Awakens, I would have rather seen like a, a weak first order. I would have rather seen some other like threat. And we were trying to figure out what that could have been besides Starkiller Base. Because like planet it's hard destroying to think is... about. Well, I, I came up with like, but they started treading in a prequel territory, but like like food shortages and things like that. Like if you were actually able to illustrate 
like what effect like a like a power hungry organization like the first order could have on a galaxy like if you were to because like in the big problem with the the trade federation in episode one and like that whole blockade and like the weird negotiations that are happening you don't Mm. really see any of the effects you know like you see like a prosperous naboo or like just a weird like a very one-sided royal naboo with like no starving people or like no problems really like Mm. they talk about all the bad things that are going to happen but like i don't really there's no sense of urgency where mm-hmm. so like if that could have been illustrated in the force awakens that's maybe a, a change and like we, we could have a whole podcast on things that i would want differently but like the the general idea is these fan edits kind of brought to light that there are problems with the force awakens sure not huge ones not like prequel level ones but like enough to make us want to change things and yeah that, that's 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 my thought you gotta read more of the books man <laughs> like like a lot of these things that you you seem to like want or like, you know, these threats or like these, uh, these effects of the empire or the first order. Like, uh, a lot of the stuff has been put into the books because they're able to kind of zoom in at a micro level into certain things. And so they can't talk about like food shortages or, you know, like, uh, the, like the, the devastation to the environment of certain people due to mining or, you know, just general destruction of planets because of the empire's need for resources. Um, that stuff's all in there, but that's, that's a whole different thing, I guess, but they're in the books, but like, I want them in the movie. <laughs> no, I totally get it. No, I, I know what you're talking about. It's just like some new threat. That's not just something that blows up stuff, you know? Um, and I am a little concerned <laughs> for, for episode eight. Like I've been really trying to avoid any sort of spoilers for the movie, but, um, I don't know. Like, I, I just, I fear that they're going to do something similar again. I don't know what they could do differently unless they were to just completely avoid like a more massive threat to the galaxy. Because if you're going to be a threat to the galaxy, you need to have some sort of massive power. And the way that you can incarnate massive amounts of power is, is in machinery and uh, destruction of planets, something that has like bearing on, lots of planets all in one go without diving into politics or uh, resources and stuff like that. So I, I'm, I'm wondering, and I'm kind of hoping that for episode eight, they can make it more about the conflict and the threat between like with just the existence of our main characters. It, I hope that this one can kind of zoom in a little bit uh, sort of like empire does and, and be more about the characters and you know good and bad alike that way you can zoom back out to a more major threat in the third film right yeah and hopefully that gives them enough time to figure out what that new big threat is going to be <laughs> not star killer 2 <laughs> yeah i mean like whatever colin maybe that's why colin trevorrow was was ousted maybe he was like All he right, we wanna, anything. we're gonna go for a bigger planet now we're gonna use a <laughs> gas giant as like <laughs> this time we're going straight to a sun <laughs> uh-huh exactly we're going <laughs> that'd be great it's like our problem is we've been using the sun for too long first we didn't even think about using a sun then we used the sun we just need a sun we're just gonna like shoot a sun at someone just just do that it's here's, fine. here's an idea uh instead of star killer or death star we have um we have like star slinger or like planet slinger and it just like it, it's this big gravitational lasso that grabs planets and just like slings them around its own orbit and then fires them away at something else like a like a stone in a sling oh i'm calling it now <laughs> this you know this make me think of is this makes me think of a dyson sphere oh what you know what dyson sphere is is that uh like a vacuum or something no I, i'm i'm gonna <laughs> I, I i'm gonna i'm gonna butcher the origins of this but essentially it's like a giant like energy device that like sits around a planet i guess it's kind of like that thing that was in the news like where that there was a shimmer in front of a sun or something like that um like and people thought it was like proof of alien life probably Mm -hmm. from like a few like six months ago or so or like maybe a year ago i don't know i'm just calling it right now there's gonna be a dyson sphere type device that's gonna pop up in a subsequent star wars film well that could be something um that's something different obviously so that's obvious that could that could be welcome um i i don't know what they're gonna do i don't like to think about it because it just it makes me anxious <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see um i don't know i i like this i thought this was fun I, this was a cool little experiment at the very least um i'm eager to see the rogue one edit i feel like it can't possibly be as good just because 
you know, dig obviously couldn't have spent as much time on it. Um, I don't, no, I don't dude, know how I long. Dis- it, I, dis- I disagree. I disagree. I from the first eight minutes that I saw, this thing is loads better than the Force Awakens edit. Really? Yeah. I, huh. we'll, we'll discuss it more, and when we get to it, we'll get there. But okay. uh, but uh, I think we should leave it for there for now. Huh. Well, I, I wish I knew when he initially, um, when like he started on this project, because he didn't he didn't really give any information as to to when he started. The initial post came in july but i don't think he did this in like a month i bet he's available for an interview (laughs) maybe i'll reach out that would be cool in any case that's it all right cool well thanks again (laughs) for joining us for episode 22 of bantha fodder i hope that you can uh possibly find this it's not super easy to find but if um if you if you google around and uh and you're crafty and you don't mind um, using software that's not necessarily considered kosher in most aspects. Good luck and uh, enjoy. <laughs> if you <laughs> Check out the show notes at uh, banthafodder.fm slash episode slash 22. You can uh, like or follow us on Facebook. Uh, do we have an Instagram? I don't think we have an Instagram. We do have uh, an Instagram. I'm just not very good at updating it because okay. I don't update my own Instagram. <laughs> yeah, neither do I. Whatever. Uh, we have a Twitter, though, Bantha Fodder FM. You can follow me at, at Mike Comite. It's C-O-M-I-T-E. Uh, follow Jake at Jacob Tender. Um, and, yeah, that's it, guys. We'll see you next time, most likely with a Rogue One edit uh, review. Toodaloo! So I feel like that adds to the emotiveness or is that a word? <laughs> I don't know. Emotivity? <laughs> <Not>. <laughs> Emotion? Emotion? Is that the word yeah. I'm looking for? Yeah. Okay. <laughs>